Hello. <laughs> Welcome to an adventure. Uh, I am Anthony Wright de Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech, and today we are um, looking at miniature books. Uh, just one weird thing on this computer here. Okay, there we go, that's better. Um, <clears throat> so welcome in. Uh, for the next two hours, we're gonna be on an adventure and we're looking at miniature books. Uh, we will talk about what that means in just a second. I just, uh, as I do every time, want to start out the stream with the Land and Labor Acknowledgement uh, from Virginia Tech. So Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their uh, continued relationships with their land and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Uh, through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention. Um, Uh, diversifying course offerings and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. Much alike. <clears throat> uh, we must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and, and were, were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to Ut Prosim, that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. Thank you for uh, coming, and thank you for letting me read that at the top of stream every, every week. One second. I have an eyelash. I had multiple distractions while I was doing that. Um, I do actually think it is very important to read that every time and to <clears throat> pay attention to what the university is committing to do and hopefully hold them accountable to it. Um, captions should be on on both channels now. I had forgotten to turn them on and paused for a second midway to get the captions going. <clears throat> Pardon me. I hope that wasn't too loud. Hi, Hannah, how are you? Um, so, miniature books. <laughs> that is our topic today. Uh, what exactly is a miniature book? Um, so, interestingly enough, uh, there is a, a, a thing called the Miniature Book Society, and I'm gonna go there and see what they say a miniature book is. Hi, Puddle Glum. <clears throat> um, welcome in. I'm, I appreciate that you have chosen to spend your break here. That is lovely. Uh, welcome. Uh, today we're looking at miniature books. So according to the Miniature Book Society's website, in the United States, a miniature book is usually considered to be one which is no more than three inches in height, width, or thickness. Some aficionados collect slightly larger books, while others specialize in even smaller ones. Uh, outside of the United States, books up to four inches are often considered miniature. The miniature book has a long and exceptional history, but why? That answer will vary with every collector, bookmaker, and tiny tome affiliate you ask. Some consider Sumerian clay tablets with cuneiform writing dated to as early as 2500 BC to be the first miniature books. Others say they originated in the Middle Ages. It's said that the earliest miniature books were produced primarily for convenience. Large proclamations transcribed into miniature for ease of storage. Miniature Bibles for monks to carry tucked in their pockets. Miniature books of etiquette for young Victorian ladies to discreetly reference for proper conduct. Queen Mary made them very popular when in 1922, 200 miniature books were produced for display in the library of her miniature dollhouse. The reason for collecting miniature books is rarely to read them, although with magnification you could. Some forms of miniature books require exceptional skill in all aspects of book production. Craft miniature books need only satisfy the maker. 
Whether it's the amazing workmanship or its delicately threaded page signatures, there is an undeniable feeling of enchantment that comes when you hold a miniature book. So, <clears throat> I actually think that's a, a really good description. Uh, what I was reading that mainly for was the general definition in the US less than three inches in any dimension uh, classifies as a miniature book. Um, it's a general definition. There's not, as far as I know, a codified definition. Um, here we have uh, we have miniature books that are just filed on our, sh or like uh, shelved on our shelves in with the rest of everything. But we also had a little box labeled miniature books um, that sits at the end of our small uh, book shelves. So um, since our shelving is not open to the public, we have it divided up somewhat differently than the way that um, the public library shelves are, are divided up. And we have uh, different shelving locations. So we have special collections small and special collections large and special collections civil war and special collections science fiction. Um, and within those, things are shelved according to their call number. But small, the shelves are closer together so we can fit more shelves in each run of shelves. And large, they're further apart so that taller items can be shelved. Um, and then of course, uh, lining the walls, we have folio, which are the really big items. But, so we have, um, we have had a little box at the end of the small section that's just a box of miniature books. Uh, so I started with this, but I knew it wasn't all of the ones that we had, and I went searching, uh, which was an adventure of itself. Kind of adorable that they're stored in their own little box. Yeah, hi, Millie Glitch. Yeah, I thought it was a good topic, kind of for the end of the year. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm After World AIDS Day last week, I wanted to do some fun things to close out the, the month. Um, I got distracted. What was I gonna say? Oh yeah, searching for. So this is the box of miniature books that was on the shelf marked as miniature books. In addition to that, Heike Squared, yes, tiny things. We, we're looking at minis today, only they're not um, like tabletop minis of your characters. They are mini books. Um, these are all the mini books that I found by searching our catalog, looking for miniature books. Um, some of them had the word miniature in, in the notes section of the catalog record. Most of them did not. Most of them I found by searching for a keyword that was two letters, MM, uh, because we don't have a field to identify the size of the books. So I actually searched for millimeters, which is just in the description of a lot of our items, like centimeters and millimeters are noted and like the dimensions of the book will be noted, but it's just in a notes field or in a description field. And so the only way to search it was to do a keyword search and the only keyword that I could key off of was MM for millimeters. Um, and surprisingly that worked. It only gave me five pages of results when I limited it to the special collections holdings. And from there I was able to uh, kind of skim down through and identify the things that appeared to be miniature books and then go and pull them. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, there was not a way to filter by dimension. It, it took a little bit of thinking and, and searching. Hi, was not worth it. They do need a miniature shelf to scale. That is true. <laughs> so they're books for your tabletop minis. Uh, I think they would, they would be folios uh, for your minis. So given the, the normal scale of a tabletop mini, um, these books would count as folio volumes for them. So if you're not familiar with the term, a folio volume are the really large books. Uh, anywhere, I, I don't know exactly where they start, but basically um, they can get super big. 
Uh, we have what would technically be folios that are full newspaper pages bound, uh, large volumes. Whereas a book, a book like this, let me take the card out for a second, a book, book like this counts as a mini book for us, but this would definitely be like folio size for a mini. It's as tall as the mini. Whereas one of the books that we will be looking at, uh, one second, I just want to put this card back in here so I don't lose it. <clears throat> Whereas this book would just be large for the mini. This book is about the size of the 3D printed book that you would get your miniature holding if you were buying a mini off of like Hero Forge or something. Uh, <laughs> uh, when, when I said MM, <laughs> your mind went to mini manuscripts, not millimeters. Um, so, the question is, do we start with the tiny books? Or do we start with some of the mini books? I think we're going to start with some mini books first. Uh, and save the tiny books for at least a second, because they're pretty cool. Um, but I, I want to look at a standard size mini book first. So, what we're going to start with is this item. Oh, it's glossy. Hang on, let me turn off this light. And give it some autofocus. My Favorite Teeny Tiny Strawberry Animal Story Library. I know nothing about this book, other than that it met the criteria to be pulled for miniature books. So we're going to learn together. Uh, I'm just going to Google the title real quick. My Favorite Teeny Tiny Strawberry Animal Story Library. And so this is actually a library of six books, as you can see. <clears throat> Let's see what kind of description we can get on this. There's an entry on Goodreads. Let's see what they say there. Usually there's some descriptive information on Goodreads. Um, nope. Let's see. Abe Books, maybe they have something. About this item, first editions. Well, the one they're selling is a first edition. Illustrated throughout by Diane Dawson, six volumes in printed slipcase, small books, uh, 10 centimeters, fine in thick wrappers and fine slipcase. Six children's classics retold. The Three Billy Goats Gruff, The Three Little Pigs, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, Mr. Hedgehog and Mr. Hare, the Town Mouse and the Country Mouse, The Beautiful Lion. Uh, surprisingly, very scarce. <laughs> um, I'm, I don't know why it's called Teeny Tiny Strawberry Animal Story Library. That's what I want to know. What's up with the title? Uh, but I'm not seeing anything that is giving me information on the title. Uh, but indeed, we do have the three little pigs. Lovely little illustrations on these. Uh, this isn't glossy anymore. I can brighten it up a little by turning this light on. Does it say it did not? Not on Abe Books it didn't. Let me see if there's anything on Biblio. <clears throat> By Maria Polskin Robbins. <clears throat> Distributed by, by LaRusse and Company, Incorporated, 1978. Nothing about number of copies published. Strawberry Books might be a publisher or series. Oh, that would make sense if it, like, a pub, like Golden Books. That, that's a great theory, Puddleglum. 
And I, it hadn't even thought, I hadn't even thought of that. It looks like One Strawberry Incorporated is the address or, or po the, the, the company that it was published under. Yeah, so copyright 1978 by One Strawberry Incorporated. So that would be where Strawberry comes in. They are gorgeous. Um, let's, let's just look. Because remember the description that I read for what miniature books is, or are, um, talked about that they tend to be done kind of for artistic purposes or they're not necessarily done for mass market distribution. A lot of times they're boutique items, specially crafted for a specific purpose or a specific uh, uh, patron. Um, and so in this case, In that case, you can get very gorgeous items. I think these technically are slightly taller than three inches, so they wouldn't necessarily meet the definition of a miniature book in the US, but I would call them that. Also uh, noted here on the bottom of the package, six volumes, 348 pages, um, illustrated throughout, $5.95. And this came out in 1970, of course. Tiny Strawberry Books, distributed by LaRousse, or 1970s, not 1970. <clears throat> I just, when I saw this one, I was like, this is really neat. I need to look at this one. Um, okay, so we have this lovely art on the front, and then Actually, in the book, it has these gorgeous illustrations um, by Diane Dawson. Like, these are small enough that a child could put them in their pocket and carry them around, which is not necessarily what they were for, but theoretically they could be used that way. Blowing down the straw house. Absolutely gorgeous art in these. And immediately lose them. Yeah, Kira. <laughs> Tiny strawberries. Yes. So three little pigs. The three billy goats gruff, which is a tale I am much less familiar with because it was not in Stephen Sondheim's Into the Woods. Um, <laughs> I don't, I, I don't think I ever really knew this one. Now. Oh yes, or put them through the la laundry. They're too pretty for that. Under the bridge lived a troll who was ugly. Coat stew, oh. I, I don't actually remember these, this children's tale very well, but it's beautifully illustrated here. Uh, then there's one that I don't think I've ever heard of, The Beautiful Lion. I am not familiar with this tale. If somebody knows the story and wants to share a brief synopsis uh, in, a, in a very short chat comment, I would be very interested to know what this story is about. You'll be finding wet paper pulp in the washing machine days later. Indeed, Simsilica. Uh, because we're, we're not reading, we're more looking at the art today or just trying to see what the point is behind these. Plus, these are copywritten 1978, so I don't want to like share too much of them. And they're rather lengthy. Uh, that would take a, quite a while to read through the whole thing even with the pages here, or even with just small bits on the pages, because we want to look at the art. The lion is admiring itself in the pool of water and the giraffe, look at the expression on the giraffe's face. It's looking back at that lion like, kind of judgy. I do not know this tale at all. Uh, 
It's gorgeous though, absolutely a gorgeous book. like possibly a hippopotamus joined. Don't know it. The drawings are extremely detailed. Like the artwork here is just gorgeous. Um, the next one here is The Town Mouse and the Country Mouse, which is definitely a story that I learned growing up. Not that I recall anything of the plot to the story. I just know it's one that I read as a child. Absolutely beautiful. Tiny strawberry books. Yeah, I guess that it, it's similar to golden books. Retold by Maria Robbins. The city mouse or town mouse. So pretty. Absolutely works of art here. <laughs> this is this is the type of commentary you're gonna get today. Um let's see. Oh hat. Yeah. <laughs> uh then we have Goldilocks and the Three Bears. On the back you get Goldilocks. Just gonna glance at this one a little bit here. Oof, that looks too hot. <laughs> I opened it up, I saw the illustration and I knew she was tasting the porridge that was too hot without even like looking at the text. I knew that this was the too hot porridge. That one's too cold. It's all congealed. Baby bear's porridge was just right and she ate it all up. These are so pretty. Sleeping in my bed. There she is. There's one more here. 70s dad playing a guitar. You can practically hear the soundtrack. <laughs> um, oh, I can I can adjust the sound or the, the music. Sorry. That should uh, that should help with the the volume level on the music there, Hannah. I'm sorry about that. Mr. Hedgehog and Mr. Hare. I don't know this one either. Uh, if it's still too loud, let me know and I can I can bump it down even more. But yet another children's story that I don't think I have ever encountered. So there's two in this collection of three that I am not familiar with. We don't have a particular focus of collecting children's literature in special collections. Um, there is a children's literature collection in our main library. The hare wants to race the hedgehog. Is this like the tortoise and the hare? Oh, puddle. Uh, I hope that the rest of your workday goes well, and um, the VOD will be available if you want to check back in and see some of the other tiny books that we look at, uh, but thank you for dropping in. Mr. Hare was off in a flash. I don't know this story. We do have a children's cookbook and nutrition literature section. Yes, we have oddly specific collection of storybooks for children that feature food and food advertising. Um, this is.
this... I have never heard this story. Mr. Hedgehog and Mr. Hare. It's not a story I had ever heard, but it is essentially the tortoise and the hare, only different, but it's the same, the same like story just from flipping through it there. Oh, Kira, uh, <laughs> I hope your meeting goes well and I will see you later. All right, I'm gonna put these back in their box. A lovely little tiny little library there. I will stick the barcode back in here. That's a pretty cool one. Uh, let's see, what's in the this box here? We have another tiny little library. Let's look at that and then we'll do the, the three teeny, teeny, tiny books. Um, ooh, these appear to be cataloged individually. That's interesting. Uh, okay, one second. I just need to mentally, <laughs> so that I get them all back in the right order and can show it off. Uh, okay. Next up, we have the Nutshell Library by Maurice Sendak from Harper and Row Publishers. Let's see what we can learn about the Nutshell Library. Wow, I just started typing Nutshell Library and it the top result recommendation was Nutshell Library book by Maurice Sendak. Um, probably because I've been Googling tiny little books, but uh, interesting that that was the first thing to pop up. Um, HarperCollins has a page about it. So from Maurice Sendak and Caldecott, the, the Caldecott medal winning genius who created Where the Wild Things Are comes Nutshell Library which will enchant readers with four classic tales. Yes, it is the Where the Wild Things Are author. Containing pocket-sized versions of perennial favorites, alligators all around, chicken soup with rice, one was Johnny and Pierre. This pint-sized library is perfect for small hands. Learn the alphabet with silly alligators. Drink chicken soup with rice every month. Count visitors with a boy named Johnny. And survive a scare with a boy who doesn't care. Endless adventures await in these lyrical stories that children and their grown-up readers will love reading and sharing over and over again. A wonderful stocking stuffer or baby shower gift. Maurice Sendak's Nutshell Library will evoke powerful memories for many, and the rhymes and stories continue to speak to new generations of little ones. And if you prefer your Nutshell Library books on their own, and not quite so tiny, each is also now available in a board book edition. <laughs> All right, I am not familiar. I, I don't think I'm familiar with any of these titles, uh, but... <laughs> that was as described by HarperCollins. Um, all right. First, we have chicken soup with rice. I, I forgot to bring a... Um, I was going to bring... I was going to bring a ruler. I forgot to bring a ruler. I have, though, something with no identifying information on it uh, that I can use. I have a wallet punch card um, that I can show you. So something, it's roughly the size, slightly, slightly smaller than a credit card but a wallet punch card here. And you can see this book is not really much bigger than a wallet punch card. Um, yes, so the punch card is business cards sized. Um, standard US business card. I don't know if business cards are different size in other countries. But yeah, this book itself is just slightly wider than a business card. 
<laughs> um, yes, seven more coffees to go before a freebie, <laughs> except uh, chai tea, but yes. Um, chicken soup with rice. He's small book. Um, these are the same size as, so the, the books that we were just looking at are the same. Actually, sl slightly larger. They're just a tiny bit taller. Um, <clears throat> so we've, we've gone down in size just a teensy, teensy bit. Um, so. All right, uh, a book of months. Oh wait, no, I think I do know this book or this story. So this is copyright 1962 by Maurice Sendak for Mrs. Ida Pearls. I'll, I'll read maybe two of these. Uh, I'll read January, but I'm not going to read them all because 1962, under copyright. Hi, Stephen Kill. Thank you for the resubscription. Welcome in. In January, it's so nice while slipping on the sliding ice to sip hot chicken soup with rice. Sipping once, sipping twice, sipping chicken soup with rice. and you get lovely little illustrations. Like I said, it's under copyright. I can't read the whole thing out to you, but. In September for a while, I will ride a crocodile down the chicken soupy Nile. Paddle once, paddle twice, paddle chicken soup with rice. So it's a um, children's book designed to help children learn about the months of the year with a little poem about, about chicken soup with rice every month. Millie Glitch, thank you for resubscribing with Prime for your second month. Thank you. So that is chicken soup with rice. Let's see, what do we have now? We, we have uh, alligators all around. An Alphabet by Maurice Sendak. An alligator jamboree with the letters A through Z. So this one is children's book to help teach the alphabet with little illustrations of alligators. And they were from the 1960s. So some content from the time period that we would prefer were not there today, such as depictions of indigenous peoples. Let's see, quite quarrelsome, <laughs> pushing people. I mean, we, we regularly encounter things like that on this stream because um, we are indeed looking at historical documents. Uh, so it's not uncommon that we find it. One was Johnny, a counting book. So, we, so far we've had um, a book of months to teach children about the months of the year, an alphabet to teach children the alphabet, uh, one was Johnny, a counting book. One was Johnny, but that's not all. Count the others who came to call. One was Johnny. Let's see. Who lived by himself. Two was a rat who jumped on his shelf. Three was a cat who chased the rat. I could go on, but um, copyright says I shouldn't. So... <laughs> But basically, it's just teaching to count as new creatures show up. Uh, 
with lovely little illustrations. These are gorgeous, tiny little books here. <laughs> but Johnny apparently liked being all alone. <laughs> and he liked it that way. I, I, like, I like that it's an introvert, kind of. I don't know. But I interpret it that way now. Then we have Pierre, a cautionary tale in five chapters and a prologue. Pierre, a story with a moral air about Pierre who learned to care. This one I'm not sure I know. I think I have definitely seen the other three, so it would be surprising to me if I had not seen this one. But I don't know. There once was a boy named Pierre who only would say, I don't care. Read his story, my friend, for you'll find at the end that a sensible moral lies there. And again, those lovely 1963 illustrations in this book, they are quite good. And definitely Maurice Sendak artistic style um, in line with like where the wild things are. <laughs> the moral of Pierre is care. Um, that seems like a moral that many, many people could learn today. Um, okay, so that is The Nutshell Library by Maurice Sendak. Let me, let me get the uh, catalog cards into the books again in the proper order, since apparently every individual book in this was individually cataloged and has its own barcode. So that's just going to take me one second. And then we will look at the smallest books that we have in our collection. I gave you a quick preview of one at the very top of stream. Um, all right. <clears throat> so I have three items. They, they are in these little envelopes here. They are... Washington, His Farewell Address by George Washington, Addresses of Abraham Lincoln by Abraham Lincoln, and Extracts from the Autobiography of Calvin Coolidge by Calvin Coolidge. So, there is the Calvin Coolidge book. I don't know why this one's in plastic. The other two are not, but we'll go with it. There is the Abraham Lincoln book. Let's see. Oh, let's... You'd be more alarmed if the autobiography of Calvin Coolidge was by somebody else. Um, and then there's the George Washington book. <clears throat> and for reference again, my... Uh, punch card from the coffee shop uh, that is the size of a business card here in the U.S. Each of these books, much smaller than the, the punch card. They are about the size of a U.S. postage stamp, actually slightly smaller than a U.S. postage stamp. On the other hand, it seems appropriate to have a tiny book by Coolidge, who was famous for not saying much. Well, we will be looking inside of these in just a second, but I did a little search at the top of stream um, just to see why Washington, Lincoln, and Coolidge. Washington and Lincoln together, I get. Calvin Coolidge seems out of left field, considering I, I was like, do we just only have three? Were there more published and we just have three in the series? Um, these three are the only three that were ever published. 
by this publisher. Uh, they are from Kingsport Press in Kingsport, Tennessee. They are the Kingsport Press Miniature Presidential Books. 1929 to 1932 is the time span as, of when they were published. Um, I, I found a record for them at the Kingsport Public Library, whose archives also has a copy of each of them. Uh, but let's see. There's not, a, they don't have a whole lot of information either, but um, the miniature books in this collection were created by the Kingsport Press Training Division as student exercises in 1929, 1930, and again in 1932. And, and these are the books. Uh, so they were training for people at this publisher. Um, and uh, yeah, every reference to them these are the only three volumes. Let's see. Among the sm so, I found um, a site bromerbooksellers.blogspot.com. Um, Bromer Booksellers is the leading specialist in miniature books. This is themselves saying that, but. Um, whenever they are on display, the tiny volumes measuring under three inches always attract quite a bit of attention. People are often curious as to why someone would create books so small. One answer to this question is revealed in the history of the miniature books here. Uh, so this bookseller that specializes in miniature books, these are among the smallest books that they have. Set of leather bound Volumes, published by Kingsport Press, Addresses of Abraham Lincoln, published in 1929, that is the red one here. Uh, extracts from the Autobiography of Calvin Coolidge, published in 1930. And Washington, His Farewell Addresses, published in 1932. Measuring a mere 7 eighths by 5 eighths inches, the books are smaller than postage stamps. The Addresses of Abraham Lincoln, was proclaimed the smallest book in America upon its publication. Uh, in order to graduate from the training division, students were required to create a piece that demonstrated their mastery of the program. One student chose to create a miniature book as a final project, which attracted the attention of the press's management. They thought that the miniature book could be used as a clever way to generate publicity and a creative form of advertising. As a training exercise, the students of the training division produced an edition of 150 books of Lincoln's addresses for the company to distribute without any charge. In 1928, the students sent an exhibit of the book to the Employing Bookbinders of America convention in Boston, which won the prestigious first prize. So there's a whole uh, blog entry. I'm not going to read the entire thing, but um, there's an entire blog entry, uh, I will drop a link in here, um, dot blogspot.com. Oh, actually one second, I need to copy the link, I can't just type it, whoops. Thank you, browser, for not letting me just accidentally quit out of the entire uh, browser. <laughs> uh, <laughs> giant me arm. <laughs> I don't have arms. What are you talking about? Um, I do have arms. All right. Uh, Kingsport Press Miniature Books. Uh, da, 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 da. Aha, let me grab this, drop the link in here so that if you wish to learn more, there is a blog 
a post about these books specifically that you can refer to later. I'm just gonna drop that in the other channel's chat as well, real quick, one second. Go, grab this link, drop in chat. There we go. Uh, so, what do you say we look inside one? <laughs> I don't know. Um, let's start with Lincoln. It was the first one published. I do not know how far in I can zoom in case. I need it. I have a magnifying glass. <laughs> so we're going to zoom all the way in. And that may actually be too close. Amazing. This camera is really nice. All right, let's zoom out a little bit. Okay, that's too far out. Let's zoom in just a tiny bit more and we'll autofocus here in just a second. Autofocus. I don't know if that means that the text inside will be legible, but there you can see the cover. <laughs> and my gigantic fingers. Um, and here on the spine, it just, the spine is a little misaligned on this one, but that's fine. Lincoln. Nothing on the back for this one. But yeah, these books are about the size that if you were building a mini on heroforge.com, um, this is about the size of the book they'd be holding. So let's, I'm, I don't have tweezers with me, so I have to rely on my thumbnail here. Um, here we go. Oh, I'm too far off to the side. So even there, like the text is pretty small and kind of washes out. Nope too much extra light. And so in person, I actually can't read it at all. Uh, what you're seeing on screen is easier to try and read, but honestly, the text is so tiny, the font size, this is like a one or a two point font. Um, <laughs> This is just starting to get to the size of things you work with on a daily basis. Um, I don't know if this will work. I don't know if that helped you at all. It sort of helped me. Oh, but here, we, if I go here, it doesn't really help for screen, but it helps in person a great deal. Um, so this page, on the right here is page 99. Constitution is left an open question, precisely as the same question as to the restraint on the power of the territories was left open in the Nebraska Act. Uh, so part of the heading on that page is divided. Um, so these are from Lincoln's talks. Um, George Washington, volume here. We'll just take a quick look at that one. Um, you get the little stars on the tiny, tiny leather cover and the, the stylized GW on the front. Yeah, I think this cover is very, very gorgeous. The Lincoln one is, is so simple, um, but honestly a classic cover design. Um, but the stars wrap all the way around. It is so pretty, Stephen. Uh, and then continue on to the back there. Um, the color on this one, I believe is a brown. Uh, the coloration on this camera 
with the lighting kind of makes the background backdrop look blue, which it is not, it is black. Um, the other cover was red, this one is brown. Um, and again, if I open it up here, ooh, sorry, I'm gonna be gentle with this one. The cover is coming off of this one. Um, so what you can see there, I don't know if you can make it out. I can barely make it out with my actual eyes here in person. And the magnification is not, not going to get crisper. Um, it says Washington's farewell address. But this camera is meant for displaying eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper. <laughs> like it's meant to connect to a projection system and take an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper and project it onto a wall. That's what this camera is intended for. <laughs> the camera is doing its best. So um, yeah, absolutely gorgeous, tiny little book here. And I'm trying to make sure that I stay in the camera view, but it is hard because this thing is so small. <laughs> it's small. Um, the third one here, which was actually the second one published, is the Calvin Coolidge one. And again, I don't know why Coolidge. I, growing up, we hear about like George Washington and, and speeches that Washington made. I can't off the top of my head think of any that I was in asked to learn about Washington's speeches, but he was one of the founding fathers. He was the general of the U.S. Army. He was the first president of the United States. It makes sense that he would be a figure that his words would be paid attention to in that, that way. Lincoln has several addresses that are commonly learned. And um, so also makes sense there. I have never, had anyone ask about Coolidge? So, don't know about Coolidge and why Coolidge was here uh, as a part of this. Um, I'm guessing because these were student projects, whatever student was in charge of selecting what would be done must have liked Calvin Coolidge. Um, Let's see, I, I will try. He was recently president when these were published. Okay, was not worth it. That would make sense. I don't know if, oh, I'm off. That's kind of the best I can do. Uh, up a little too far there. Ooh, trying it, trying so hard. Um, extracts from the autobiography of Calvin Coolidge, Kingsport Press Incorporated, Kingsport, Tennessee, 1930. <laughs> the only reference you remember hearing for Coolidge is in the movie Singing in the Rain. Um, I should know references from Singing in the Rain. I don't. The, the old movie musicals were never my favorites. I'm aware of them, but I, I don't know them as well as other musicals. <laughs> Entering and leaving the presidency. It is a very old saying that you never can tell what you can do until you try. <laughs> and then it, it, they managed to get one sentence on here with a, a um, title for the chapter. Um, but also this, this book is also as kind of as gorgeous. Um, so this was the second one published and you get the, the C, the embossed C in the leather. Um, this one is blue leather. Um, and you get a different star effect, but another star effect here. Um, so, you can see the progression of the artistry in the books from the first to the third published. I'm gonna zoom out a little so I can get all three of them on camera again. 
because um, we definitely zoomed in a lot to share all the, to share these as as close-ups there. Um, so you can see a very very standard uh, design on the first cover, like very classic, and then they they embellish it a little bit with the Coolidge one, um, add a little bit of art to it, which these are works of art. So it makes sense that, uh, and honestly, this was a student project. The first one was just a student project. He chose to do it himself. And then they produced them as copies of the one that he did. Uh, the second one here is, <laughs> the margins are really wide, indeed, Millie. Um, the second one here is they already know they've chosen to do a miniature book again. And so they already know that they're going to want, that, that they're going to produce it as something to give away and as a promotional item. So approaching it more artistically makes a lot more sense. <clears throat> and then by the time they do the third one, we're right on that promotional train. Like, look at what we can do in such a small package. Um, and so you get the, the really artistic with the, the shooting stars and um, the nicely stylized GW on it. Um, they're, they're really gorgeous works of art. And I'm very happy that I was able to locate them by searching our catalog for MM. <laughs> because these were not in the uh, the box labeled miniature books. All right, so I'm going to put these away. If you want to know more, I did drop that link into the chat earlier, um, where there's a, a, the link to the uh, Bromer Booksellers blog post about these books. Um, just grab the Coolidge one here. Set these aside. Let's see what else we can look at. Um, we have one more hour. Let's see what's next. Oh, I've got one here. Oh, from 1870. Uh, one that uh, some of you may be familiar with. One that I'm not especially familiar with myself. It, you can see it is in a box here. Uh, honestly, this looks like a microfilm box to me. Um, and this one, rather thick. Oh, let me, let me zoom out so that you can actually see the item. We're working on much, much, much larger scales now. This is the size of a business card. So gigantic compared to the books that we were just looking at. Uh, <laughs> can anyone guess what this book is that is very thick, but very uh, compact? It folds open and closed. Close Millie Glitch. Um, it is not indeed a Bible. It is the Episcopal Book of Common Prayer. Uh, this one published in 1870. Um, so one of the stated purposes when we looked up what miniature books were one of the common purposes was to have essentially a pocket-sized bible or a pocket-sized religious reference uh, so this being the book of common prayer would have been something that could be carried around um, <clears throat> by a faithful person who wanted to have these prayers with them at all times um, the Book of Common Prayer and the Administration of the Sacraments and other rites and ceremonies of the Church according to the use of the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States of America together with the Psalter or Psalms of David. And that is the full title. 
of this book. <laughs> I love old books and their exceptionally long titles. Um, I saw handwriting. Where did it go? Oh, it's between these two pages that don't want to come apart. Aha, here we are. Um, okay, now I get to try and read old cursive. We always enjoy this, don't we? Mademoiselle Mary Ball. Uh, oh, and it's in French. <laughs> it, it's 1800s cursive in French. Uh, lighting it up f for you did not help, so I will turn that off again. Um, uh, Mademoiselle Mary Ball. Dissatisfaction. Huh. I can't quite make out what this word is. But essentially, it seems like something about seeking the satisfaction of paradise. It looks like Leesburg? Not certain. Um. I, I know tiny bits of French. <laughs> uh, so it, I would need to experiment with Google Translate in order to figure out exactly what it is. I believe it is a note to the recipient, Millie Glitch. That is, that is my guess. Speaking of specialized books, you saw a special new edition of Pride and Prejudice that had physical letters you could pull out and read instead of having them just printed in the book. Um, yeah, Hannah, uh, book art or uh, like the art of books is a thing and um, special editions that are artistic pieces of their own um, are indeed a, a common thing. Well, not, not so common that you find them all the time, but um, they're often done, <clears throat> and I find them rather interesting. If you are at all interested in um, seeing book art, uh, I would recommend the University of Iowa. Um, they have a program on the art of the book, and they have, in their special collections, they have a lot of book art where the books themselves are artistic pieces. Um, and they should have some material that's online, but also you being located um, in that region of the country could also possibly just go and visit special collections at the University of Iowa and see some of the book art and touch some of the book art in person. Um, but yeah, I do know that that is one of the things that, that their special collections actually specializes in is book art. We don't really have a book art here, at least not in our collections. There may be some book art like in our art and architecture library, um, but I don't work with those collections directly. So Book of Common Prayer, rather thick and chunky, definitely would not be um, comfortable in a pocket. Like you would know it was there. You would always know it was there, um, but if you had a reason to carry around, like for ladies, this would easily fit in a purse. Uh, for men, this would easily fit in a purse because men also used to carry purses. Um, and in religious regalia, there would definitely be pockets capacious enough to hold this book. Do I know how heavy this book is? Um, Oh, your campus recently opened a bookbinding makerspace. That is pretty awesome. We don't do a lot of like book art here. We have a, a huge makerspace in the library, but it's focused on like 3D printing and uh, other things like that. I'll have to check with them and see if they would consider adding bookbinding to their services. That might be interesting. Um, 
let me see if I can pull up the catalog record for this and see if it notes how heavy it is. Um, I'm not a great judge. I would say, uh, nope, I'm, I'm not even gonna guess because it's gonna be totally wrong. Uh, just, uh, let me see if weight happens to be noted. Otherwise I will try to give a guess. Uh, <laughs> It's not, like, guessing the weight of things is not a skill that I have uh, cultivated. So, nope, that's not what I want. I want spec small and I want book of common prayer. Let's see what we come up with. Five results. Um, All right, what is your call number? BX5145A41870A, this one. Just says nine centimeters. It doesn't give a weight on it. I would say it's probably about a half a pound. Um, it's not super heavy and I, sorry that I don't have any conception of how to translate a pound of weight into any other measure of weight. Um, I would, this is not, not a full pound. It's less than a pound in weight, but it is very thick and it is definitely heavier. I would say it's more on par with like a paperback novel, like a, a, a mid-sized paperback novel. It's, a, it's about that weight. Like a, a paperback novel that was, say, only like that thick. So it's, it's a, a bit weighty. But still super small. Um, let's see, what else do I have? I have, what else do I have? I have lots of stuff. I don't really need to ask what else do I have. I have tons and tons of things that I can share with you. Um, let's see. It's just what order do I want to share them in? What seems the most interesting? Oh, there's one that was on my, if I can locate it. That I was very interested in, that I used in my tweet. Um, and I was like, hmm, that's an interesting title. Oh, there's an interesting one. Oh, Eugene O'Neill. Um, is it, no? Oh, but recipes for cocktails and beverages. That sounds fun. Where, where, where? Maybe it's in the other. Let's see, tiny picture book. There's one about uh, flirting. Just don't know Ah, here we go. And then after these, we will look at approximately 400 grams. Thank you, Key Squared. <laughs> um. So after these two I have a, a whole set that I want to look at, uh, or after these three, I have a, a set that I would like to look at that's um, cooking related. So this one just caught my eye because of the title. Zoom in a bit. The Last Will and Testament of an Extremely Distinguished Dog by Eugene O'Neill. Uh, so I'm assuming this is a play because Eugene O'Neill is a playwright. And I'm just, it's not one that I'm familiar with, but you can see the lovely marbled paper here. Um, ink marbling like this is interesting in the way that it's done. Uh, I've seen it done 
at uh, the National Printing Office in Washington, D.C. I'm not an expert. I've only, I saw it done once and can't really even describe it, but basically they took different inks and drizzled them in water and then like dipped the pages in. Uh, and it, it forms a completely unique thing. Um, and I've only ever seen it done on the edges of the paper. I don't know if that's the same method for how it would be done to create full pages like this or not. Um, but it's, it's an interesting technique. Um, these pages have some texture to them too. I don't know that it shows up on camera, but they've got like a rippling effect to the, the page itself. Um, Look at the picture. Um, the picture is an inset. It's just pasted onto the page. You can kind of see how it, I'm not gonna pull on it, but. Uh, looks like this was published in Worcester, Mass, 1972. Very similar process for a paper like this. You just lay it flat on the surface rather than dipping the edges in. That would make sense, Millie, and that would be my guess as to how it's done, but um, not being an expert, I was like, I don't know for certain. Uh, the last will and testament of Silver Dean Emblem O'Neill by Eugene O'Neill, copyright 1956 by Carlotta Monterey O'Neill, and published by permission of the trustees under the will of Carlotta Monterey O'Neill. The reputation of Eugene O'Neill as the American Shakespeare was established even before his death in 1953. O'Neill's output was formidable, more than 30 plays, including the posthumously produced classic Long Day's Journey into Night. He won a Nobel Prize, he was a Nobel Prize winner and four-time Pulitzer Prize winner. Reflecting his own tempestuous emotional background, he came from a yeasty but tragic Irish-American theatrical family. His plays are rarely easygoing. Let's see. So his epitaph to his dog is a rarity among O'Neill's documents, sentimental, even whimsical, close in spirit to his one major comedy, Ah, Wilderness. The dog was acquired at a relatively peaceful period of O'Neill's life. He and his protective third wife, the beautiful actress Carlotta Monterey, looked upon it as their child. O'Neill wrote uh, Blemmy's will as a comfort to Carlotta just before the dog died in its old age in December 1940. He's so cute. Oh my gosh, it's, it's written as like a will and testament. And again, this is under copyright. I can't read the entire thing and we don't have time to read the whole thing anyway, but I, Silverdean Emblem O'Neill, familiarly known to my family, friends, and acquaintances as Blemmy, because the burden of my years and infirmities is heavy upon me and I realize the end of my life is near, do hereby bury my last will and testament in the mind of my master. He will not know it is there until after I am dead. Then, remembering me in his loneliness, he will suddenly know of this testament and I ask him then to inscribe it as a memorial to me. I have little in the way of material things to leave. Dogs are wiser than men. They do not set great store upon things. They do not waste their days hoarding property. They do not ruin their sleep, worrying about how to keep the objects they have and to obtain the objects they have not. There is nothing of value I wish to, I have to bequeath except my love and my faith. These I leave to all those who have loved me, to my master and mistress, who I know will mourn me most, to Freeman, who has been so good to me, to Sin and Roy and Willie and Naomi, and, but if I should list all those who have loved me, it would force my master to write a book. Perhaps it is vain of me to boast when I am so near death, which returns all beasts and vanities to dust, but I have always been an extremely lovable dog. <laughs> um, that is, it's, Precious, I can't read any more because that is like half of it that I have read. Uh, let me look. Uh, it, 
it is definitely out there and available if you're very, if you're at all interested in in having a copy for yourself or accessing a copy it is the last will and testament of an extremely distinguished dog you should be able to find a copy at your local library i would hope um or ask for one via uh interlibrary loan if you're interested in um, getting to see the entire work. Um, let's see, next I have The Little Flirt. So again, with the business card sized card test, slightly shorter width-wise and just slightly taller height-wise. The cover just says uh, the little flirt. There's no other information on it. Apparently, at one point in time, it was acquired from L.A.L. Smith & Company Book and Novelty Emporium in Palatine, Illinois. The Little Flirt, containing handkerchief, glow, gl nope, that says glove, containing handkerchief, glove, fan, and parasol, flirtations with the floral language of love. Entered according to Act of Congress in the year 1871 by Fisher and Dennison in the office of the Librarian of Congress at Washington, D.C. Number one, admiration. Handkerchief flirtations. Drawing it across the lips, desiring an acquaintance. Drawing across the cheek, I love you. Drawing it across the forehead, look, we are watched. Drawing across the eyes, I am sorry. Drawing it through the hands, I hate you. Drawing, uh, dropping, we will be friends. Folding it, I wish to speak with you. It's the, uh, the language of flowers. <laughs> it's the, like the, the spy language. Um, number two, flirtation. Handkerchief flirtations. Letting it rest on the right cheek, yes. Letting it rest on the left cheek, no. Letting it remain on the eyes, you are so cruel. Opposite corners in both hands. Do, uh, do wait for me. Over the shoulder, follow me. Placing it over the right ear, how you have changed. Putting it in the pocket, no more love at present. <laughs> uh, number three, hesitation. Handkerchief flirtations. Taking it by the center, you are most too willing twisting it in the left hand. I wish to be rid of you. Twisting it in the right hand. I love another. Twirling it in both hands. Indifference. Winding it around the forefinger. I am engaged. And winding it around the third finger. I am married. Uh, <laughs> number four, declaration. So you can see why this is a pocket book, right? Why this is a tiny book. Uh, if you were actually going to use the language of the flowers or the language of the handkerchief here, um, you would want a reference on hand so that you could decipher what was being said. Oh, we have glove flirtations. Biting the tips. I wish to be rid of you very soon. Clenching them. Rolled up in the right hand. No. Drawing halfway on the left hand, indifference. Drawing both of them, or dropping both of them, I love you. Dropping one of them, yes. 
folding up carefully, get rid of your company. Holding with tips downward, I wish to be acquainted. And holding them loose in the right hand, be contented. <laughs> uh, so this, this continues. We get gloves, we get parasol flirtations, and, um, ooh, and then the sentiment of flowers. Um, so you, you learn how to use your handkerchief, your gloves, and your parasol to send coded messages to uh, would-be lovers. Um, the sentiment of flowers. Mignonette, I love you more for not being more handsome. Magnolia, I love none on earth better than you. Rosebud, white, I am too young to marry just now. Rose, damask, I love, but I am too bashful to tell you. White Rose, I have great preference for married. Oleander, caution, be careful, my dear, we are watched. Narcissus, your love for yourself is greater than for me. Peach Blossom, I shall never love another as I do you. Sunflower, false, you are made up of deceit. Honeysuckle, Happiness, I will make you happy. Hollyhock, ambition, you are most too ambitious. Ivy, I can only be your friend and nothing more. Columbine, folly, you are most too foolish. Lilac, you are my first and only love. Grass, useful, but not very handsome. Lady Slipper, you are very fickle. Morning Glory, love, love me. Rose, withered, departed beauty. Hyacinth, have good faith. And Violet, white, innocence. And, and so it continues telling you the meanings of all of the different flowers. I don't know what ice plant is. The last one here is ice plant. You look so cold. That is not what I was expecting. I knew nothing of this except that the title was The Little Flirt. Uh, I had not looked at the subtitle. Not what I was expecting, but really cool. 1871. Coded flirtatious languages. Um, let's see. I think I'm going to skip this one and we're going to look at the cooking books because there's a whole set of them and they're pretty neat. Plus, I think Kira should get back soon and Kira can provide context on cooking related items. Um, <laughs> context that. I don't have, because I am not specialized in, in the cooking-related items. Um, oh, what is this one? Well, that one's rather interesting. We might look at this one first. Um, honestly, they're all gorgeous and interesting, and I want to look at them all. But no, let's find these tiny books. Tiny book, tiny book, tiny book, tiny book, chunky book. Whoop. I almost dumped the whole box. That would not have been good. Um, it's mostly empty now, but. Okay, we are gonna look at this one because it's it's neat. Uh, this is called Tiny Picture Book. It has tape. Generally, archives and tape not happy together. Uh, but I would say this appears to be an art book or like an art, like what we were talking about before, book as art. Uh, so there's a like a sleeve that is taped together with this bicycle tape. And then here, if I slide out the book from the sleeve, 
trying to do so. Uh, there is another sleeve in this kind of textured paper with the same bicycle tape. Um, I think just based on the fact that the tape is folded over there, I think this was intended for you to unwrap it uh, and to actually like open the tape in order to get at the book which we will not be doing because that would destroy it. But you get tiny picture book. It's got a little bit of like water damage there, but. The Tiny Picture Book, published by George W. Hobbs, Charlestown, Mass. Um, I don't see a date on the cataloging label. A very shaky hand here. Um, I need a little bit light of light. This is the first book that I And that's as much as I can make out. This is the first book that I. Something Strength by Myself, which I have, huh. November 1st, 1868. I don't, I can't make out the writing um, to get the entire statement there, uh, but we did get a date, November 1st, 1868, tiny picture book. It's in color. Oh, it's an alphabet book. Apples so round and bright and red. Oh, how I love to see. They look so tempting as they hang upon the green old tree. A naughty boy once tried to steal from off his neighbor's bough, but sad to hear a down he fell and... I'm gonna stop there because that is a word that... In the time that word was regularly used to refer to people who with permanent injuries. Um, it is not a term that is um, a good one to use today, so I'm just not gonna say it. You can see it there on the screen if you really want to know, but. Uh, boys oftentimes are rough and rude and join in wicked play, but hoop and top and bat and ball are better any day. Hark, hark, I hear a tinkling bell. I, it calleth me to school. Run away, my boy, and study well. Keep strictly every rule. Interesting. Apples, boys, but for C, the picture is of a cat, but it says careful as the word to start the poem. Careful be of poor old puss, she catcheth, she catcheth, wow, I can't say that. She catcheth all the mice. If any rat appears in sight, she chases it a trice. <clears throat> and then she comes and sits her down and washes all her fur. How kind and loving doth she look, how pleasant, pleasant doth she purr. Dogs, eggs, frogs. It's, it's an alphabet book with um, illustrations and poems. Interestingly, I is Ibex. Ibex! What is an Ibex, Pa? said Little John one day. A strange and funny animal. Where do they live, I pray? It is a kind of goat, my son, whose horns are wondrous long. They climb the rough and snowy Alps with nimble feet and strong. Interesting choice for I. Urns, vines, zebras, zebras. A, B, C. 
Why must I learn my ABCs? asked little Kate. It wearies me. I wish to put my book away. I wish to run about and play. There's Kitty in the portico. Oh dear, if I could only go. Indeed, I think it very wrong to make poor Kitty wait so long. I gather pretty flowers for you. If I go, do let me do. If I may go, do let me do. Run and play. Now run away, you little things, and romp and jump and play. You have been quiet long enough, so run away, I say. Fred, you and Lucy, roll your hoops. You on a stick can ride, and nurse with baby run a race, or any play beside. Little boys and girls may romp and frisk and jump and play. Book and lessons both are done, so run away, I say. Interesting. This was not at all what I expected. Uh, to be inside these wrappings. But then again, I think a lot of these have not at all been what I expected. All right, tiny picture book, you are back inside your wrapping. And your envelope. Okay. So we have a series of items here. 1905, 1907. Yeah, the dates are 1905 and 1907. And they are cookbooks. So I have four of them here. We do have another one um, that is in our metadata services to be cataloged. Uh, but here we have the tiny book on sandwiches, the tiny book on the chafing dish, the tiny book on salads, and the tiny book on candies. And what I find especially interesting is in addition to each of these individual volumes, we also have the Chunky Book, which is all of these little books in one. Well, almost all. It doesn't have the candies one, but it has sandwiches, salads, chafing dish, and cocktails in the, uh, the Chunky Book, which is literally called the Chunky Book. So I thought we would spend the rest of today looking at these, unless they're extraordinarily boring, and then we'll look at some other things, because uh, we definitely haven't looked at everything that I pulled. But let's start by looking at sandwiches. So about half the width of a business card. And height-wise, about as tall. As a, as a business card is tall. In fact, the same exact height as this card. Um, I wanna see if I do a little googly, a little internet search. Tiny book on sandwiches. What can I learn? Ooh. <laughs> the place where I find information is our departmental blog. <laughs> oh, come on. Uh, a tiny post on some tiny books. Cookbooks come in all sizes and sometimes in a variety of shapes. Last year, we posted a book shaped like a cocktail shaker. This, we, this year, we're talking size. It's a tiny post on some tiny books. Just last month, we acquired three little books. And what can we say? And when we say little, we're not kidding. 
For scale, we photographed one next to a standard paperclip. It's just slightly bigger than a paperclip. Uh, this post is from October of 2013, so that's when we got the first three. Um, each devoted to one type of recipe, tiny book on salads, sandwiches, chafing dishes. All three were published in 1905 by the Livermore and Knight Company in Providence, Rhode Island. Each book has sections for different main ingredients, and you'll see a combination of common and, by modern standards, uncommon recipes. <laughs> the first question many people ask when they first see these books is, why? Is there a point to a cookbook this small? Or was it more of a gimmick? We don't have a clear answer. Uh, despite the size, the font is surprisingly readable, which can often be the case with small books, and the recipes are simple, practical, and for the most part, very likely tasty. The small size would make the books easy to store in an apron pocket, though. Uh, though good luck keeping track of them on a traditional bookshelf. Research suggests there are two more books in the series, the tiny book on candies and the tiny book on cocktails. We have the candies one here. <clears throat> the cocktails one is being cataloged. We'll keep our eyes open for these additional gems and hope you will too. And indeed, so we did find both of those, but we also got the chunky book. All right, let's see what's in this book. On lovely, lovely sandwiches. The tiny book on sandwiches, which is indeed its name and not just a description of the book. Zoom in. Autofocus. Turn off the overhead light. <laughs> Hi, Galara Dragon. Um, it is tiny. You missed tinier. Uh, just for reference, uh, so that you will know um, what you will learn about if you go back and view the VOD, this is the, the books that we were looking at earlier. <laughs> so uh, the book we're looking at right now, when open, is about the size of a business card. This is a coffee punch card that I happen to have with me. Um, this is the book that we were looking at earlier. Uh, we had three books this size earlier that's smaller than a US postage stamp. <laughs> um, so if you do uh, want to learn about the really small books that we looked at, um, uh, you can check out the VOD later here or on the university, um, the Virginia Tech University Library's YouTube channel. You, make, you used to make little books like that? That's awesome. So these are, uh, this book is from 1905, uh, copyright 1905 by Livermore and Knight Company in Providence, Rhode Island. The tiny book on sandwiches. And indeed, much, much easier to read. Uh, no, these are part of special collections, so they are for on-site use only. Um, the font here is is much easier to read than um, than the the teeny tiny books that uh, that we were looking at earlier. We have aspic jelly for sandwiches, banana sandwiches, baked bean sandwiches, bread for sandwiches, caviar sandwiches, celery sandwiches, cheese sandwiches, cheese and anchovy sandwiches. That sounds very salty. Uh, cheese and olive sandwiches. That also sounds very salty. Cheese and English walnut sandwiches. Wow, oh my gosh. Lots and lots of sandwiches. There's, that's two pages, three pages, four pages, five pages, five and a half pages of index. Right. Table of contents. What? Uh, I'm going to page 81 because I do not know what fairy sandwiches are. Uh, so interestingly, turning pages in these tiny books is definitely harder. 
chow paste? I don't know. I will, uh, I will go to that next, Galara. Um, fairy sandwiches. Brown bread, white bread, four ounces butter, four ounces powdered sugar, a small wine glass, Madeira, uh, one tablespoonful lemon juice, blanched and chopped nuts of any kind. Cream the butter and sugar together, add the wine and lemon juice, and set it on ice for an hour. Spread the mixture on thin slices of bread, sprinkle with chopped nuts. Press the white slices to the brown and stamp out in circles or triangles. I mean, the sandwiches are gonna be whatever size you make them. I, I'm sure you could do tiny ones. All right, let's see what chow paste. Page 35. Chow paste. Uh, one half cupful butter. It's kind of difficult to make out on screen there, isn't it? Let me see. I don't know if this will help you. Magnifying glass? I don't know if it's just that the lighting in here is doing weird things to it, but yeah, it's washed out, which is, it's worse today than normal. I don't know why it's so washed out today, um, but I do think it was helping make it slightly clearer. Oh, one half cupful butter, one cupful boiling water, one cupful of flour. So flour and butter and water typically would that like that would end up being like a pie crust or something or a dough of some kind, but hot, like boiling water is unusual. Three large or four small eggs. Bring the water and butter to the boiling point, beat the flour into it. When the dough cleaves from the sides to the saucepan, uh, beat the eggs in one at a time, bake in a moderate oven. So it's a bread dough with eggs in it. Hot water crust? I've never made a hot water crust myself. Chow paste. It's called chow paste. But it's, you start by just flour and water, which is dough, but then you add, you beat eggs into it and just bake it. But it's like three eggs, four, four eggs. I don't know either. It's a very strange recipe for me. Three large or four small eggs. So the eggs that you would get at the grocers today, at least in the US, uh, are almost always large eggs. So you would use three eggs. A bunch of butter. Some boiling water and some flour with eggs. Try using the small inset. I've. So for me, that works well. Um, I don't think... Oh, I mean, it, it does work. It's definitely a lot harder to navigate that on camera. Uh, but yeah, it, it works. Oh, the previous page says to use the chow paste. Chicken salad sandwiches. Chow paste, chicken salad, celery leaves. Uh, nope, not working very well. <laughs> very small field of view, but is clear. Um, I'm trying. Pimolas, I don't know what pimolas are. Or olives. Is that like pimento? What's pimolas? Bake chow paste like eclairs, 
only a little smaller. When cold, split apart on the ends and on one side and fill with chicken salad. Put the top back after inserting a celery leaf at each end. Garnish with celery leaves and olives. Other salads may be served in the same way. Ah, a, a pimola is an olive stuffed with pimento. Um, Kira, are you familiar with chow paste? We just discovered chow paste and we read the recipe and we still have absolutely no idea. <laughs> so chow paste was flour, butter, boiling water, and eggs baked. Is that just some, like, like a bread or a dough? It must be used to make miniature dishes. All right, salads. The tiny book on salads, published the same year. What we get in here are Bernays sauce, claret dressing, cooked salad dressing, cream dressing, cucumber jelly dressing for fruit salad, English salad dressing, French dressing, uh, green mayonnaise dressing, horseradish cream dressing, mayonnaise dressing, mint jelly, red mayonnaise dressing, all, all the dressings, um, German salad, anchovy salad, bluefish crab, fish salad in shells, frog salad, halibut salad, Lincoln salad, lobster salad, lobster and Saturni jelly salad. S-A-U-T-E-R-N-E, Saturni jelly. I've never heard of that. I don't know what that is. And they didn't tell me how to make it. We've got some aspics, some roe, which is fish eggs, egg salad, American corn salad, eggplant salad, tomato salad, apple salad in shells. I did not know that apples had shells. Oh, it's a French kind of wine. Thank you, Kira. Bird's nest salad. Listed under cheese salads. So turn. It's a sweet wine. I like sweet wines. 203. Well, I like some sweet wines. Um, cheese salads. I wasn't looking for cream cheese. Where's the one? Bird's nest salad. Lettuce or watercress. Uh, Neufchatel. Neufchatel cheese and French dressing. Roll the cheese into small egg shapes. Arrange the eggs in nests of lettuce or watercress. Uh, cover with a French dressing. Chopped nuts or olives can be mixed in with the cheese if liked. If necessary, the cheese can be moistened with little, a little cream and the eggs flecked with chopped parsley or paprika. I'm not going to spend too much time here because I do want to look at the other books real quick and we're running out of time. So, The Chafing Dish. So, all sorts of, we've got omelets, we've got fish, codfish tongues. Um, poultry and game, mutton and lamb, veal, all of like the hot dishes, vegetables. I have to see, I don't know. Page 75, codfish tongues. Codfish tongues. Four cold boiled codfish tongues. A clove of garlic, one tablespoonful butter, one tablespoonful flour, one pint light white wine, and salt. Bruise a clove of garlic, 
put it in the chafing dish with the butter. When melted, add the flour, then the wine gradually, stirring all the time until smooth. Put in the tongues. When hot, add a little salt and serve. Neufchatel, new chattel, new cattle. It's a, it's, it, yeah, it, it's, if, I'm, I think it's similar to like a creme fraiche, but I'm not sure. It's a cheese. It's definitely a cheese. Like cream cheese. Okay. We, we do have the little book, or the tiny book on candies. This one was published two years later than the others. Uh, so candies apparently were an afterthought. Or you just had to wait for dessert. Um, the index here, we have white coffee and maple fondant, bonbons, how to dip bonbons, maple fondant nut bars, maple and walnut fondant, Tutti Frutti Fondant, Chocolate Creams, Coconut Creams, Chocolate Chestnuts, Peppermints with Fondant. Honestly, I did not know. I, I thought fondant was like a newer thing. I did not know, like back in the early 1900s, fondant was a thing. Chocolate Mints, Peppermints, Nougat, Caramels, Fudge, Marshmallows, Pralines, Creamed walnuts, velvet molasses candy, butterscotch, whorehound candy, coconut cream candy, coconut balls, taffy, wintergreen wafers, maple creams, vanilla sugar candy, peanut candy, ice cream candy, macaroons, sugared popped corn, sponge sugar, glacé fruits, Marins glaces, caramelized nuts, crystallized nuts, salted almonds or peanuts, burnt almonds, sugared almonds, fig and nut confections, stuffed prunes, candied orange peel, and candied violets. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I would definitely lose this cookbook if I was trying to cook with it. It, it would end up in the food. It would be like the the little toy baby in the king's cake in at, at Mardi Gras. Um, so the one that we don't have individually here at the table, it's in cataloging, is the cocktails one. So I'm gonna pop into the chunky book here, glance at the cocktails if I can, and that'll be where we end. The tiny book on sandwiches. Oh, geez, they're just literally bound in order. Codfish tongues, again. Breast of duck, braised. Tiny book on cocktails. <clears throat> in as much as you will do this thing, it is best that you do it intelligently. Apple brandy, armor, brandy, 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 brant, brown, calisaya, country, champagne, champagne cocktail, fancy, chocolate, cider, clam cocktail. That's where we're going. We're going to end with a clam cocktail on page 38. I'm just going to be shellfish and pick it myself. Clam cocktail. Ingredients. Let's see. Clams. Lemon juice. Tabasco sauce. I am in no way surprised. Put into a dozen large cocktail glass a half dozen little neck clams with all their liquor, season with pepper and salt to taste. Add two dashes lemon juice, one dash Tabasco sauce, and a very little cayenne pepper. Serve with small fork or spoon in glass. What's interesting here is there's no alcohol in this one. 
It's just clams. I was expecting vodka. Quite interesting. A Rob Roy. Bitters, scotch whiskey, lemon peel, and Italian vermouth. Fill a mixing glass half full fine ice. Add two dashes Boker's Bitters, one half jigger scotch whiskey, one half jigger Italian vermouth. Mix and strain into cocktail glass. Place a small piece lemon peel on top. All right. Uh, we are going to end today on uh, this wonderful set of cooking books that are teeny tiny cooking books. Um, but that is going to be where we leave off today. Uh, let me switch over back to the face cam here and say thank you so much everybody for stopping by today. I hope that you found this enjoyable, uh, the exploration of some of the miniature and tiny books that we have in our collection. Um, I know it was a lot of fun for me to kind of learn about them and take a look at them. Um, next week, the uh, topic that I have selected is midwinter festivals, which will most likely mean primarily Christmas items, just from my knowledge of what's actually in our collection. Um, there will be cooking related things, there will be uh, some Christmas cards designed by architects. There will be, you know, kind of whatever I can find that is um, Christmas or Hanukkah, or if there's Kwanzaa, I will pull Kwanzaa. If there's Yule, I will pull Yule. Uh, so that is the plan for next week. Um, the week after, on the 22nd, uh, it will be the very last thing that I do before the university shuts down for a week. Um, but I will be here doing a show on holiday-themed cocktails and mocktails. Um, and so that will be two weeks from today, uh, right here at VTUL Studios Twitch and Rogan27 Twitch, uh, cocktails and mocktails, and might just have a special guest that day. Uh, so that will be a fun time. And then looking forward into January, when we return on January 5th, we will be looking at Australian pulp science fiction. So that is what's coming up. Uh, <laughs> and I hope to see you um, on a future Wednesday for one of those shows. Let me look and see just who we're gonna raid today. Um, I'm guessing it's going to be Shark Cam at Monterey Bay Aquarium um, because they are live and we'd like to throw things over to them. And indeed, they do have the Shark Cam and there seem like there are some fish there on that Shark Cam. Uh, so again, thank you everybody for coming by. Uh, we will be raiding over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day, and I look forward to hopefully seeing you next week for some holiday-themed items from our archives and special collections. Until then, have a good week. <laughs>